So this morning, kids, we're going to do something a little different than our normal memory verse. See, this week, we're starting to talk about why a big group of us gets together every Sunday and comes to this building. Why do we do that? What is the purpose of us gathering? And what are we supposed to do when we come together in this place? So to help us answer that question this morning, we're going to turn to a book called the New City Catechism. Now, catechism is a big word, but the main focus is learning something new. And so this book is full of questions and answers that help us learn more about what it means to be a Christian. And so this morning, we're going to turn to question number 48. And the question that is asked is, what is the church? Now, I'm going to read the first big answer that they have. And that's, God chooses and preserves for himself a community elected for eternal life and united by faith, who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. God sends out this community to proclaim the gospel and prefigure Christ's kingdom by the quality of their life together and their love for one another. Now, there are lots of big words in there, so we're going to simplify it to a shorter phrase that I'm going to encourage you to memorize with your families this week. And that is this. What is the church? A community elected for eternal life and united by faith, who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. So what that's saying is we're a community elected. Now elected might sound familiar if you've listened to your parents talk about the country sometimes. Those who are elected are chosen. And so it's saying that the church is a group of people who have been chosen by God. God came and picked you. He said, I want all of you for eternal life and united by faith. So that's saying God came to all of us in this community and said, I am choosing you to be able to live forever. And because all of us have been chosen, because each of us believe that God picked us to have eternal life, we all share that idea together. And so that's what it means to be united by faith of we all share the same idea. And so that brings us together to be friends together, to be brothers and sisters together with God as our father. So then we've been brought together. And then what do we do? Well, these are the four things that we learned this morning that we as a group who have been chosen by God are called to do together. And that is love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. So what I did to help me remember this is I did a little drawing. So you can see right in the middle there that I've got a group of people around the cross. And so that reminds me that we are a group who all believe that Jesus loves us. And then in the four corners, I have the four things that that group is called to do. We're called to love, follow, learn from, and worship. So what I'm going to challenge you to do this week is to make your own drawing. As you're memorizing that shorter sentence, which I'll remind you of in just a second, help yourself remember it 
by creating a picture, or if you're better building with Legos, whatever your preference is, find some way to build or draw a reminder of what we do at church together. So one last time, what is the church? The church is a community elected for eternal life and united by faith who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. Let's pray together. King over all, you have brought us together as the family of God. Keep us faithful to worship together, to love one another, and to provide for each other's needs. Let our fellowship be genuine and help us to spur one another on in the faith. Amen. So this morning for our sermon, we actually have two scripture passages. And the first one is from Psalm 81. So Nancy is going to read that for us now. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 81, and I'll be reading from the message. A song to our strong God, a shout to the God of Jacob, anthems from the choir, music from the band, sweet sounds from lute and harp, trumpets and trombones and horns. It's festival day, a feast to God, a day decreed by God, solemnly ordered by the God of Jacob. He commanded Joseph to keep this day so we'd never forget what he did in Egypt. I hear this most gentle whisper from one I never guessed would speak to me. I took the world off your shoulders, freed you from a life of hard labor. You called to me in your pain. I got you out of a bad place. I answered you from where the thunder hides. I proved you at Meribah Fountain. Listen, dear ones, get this straight. O oh, Israel, don't take this lightly. Don't take up with strange gods. Don't worship the latest in gods. I'm God, your God, the very God who rescued you from doom in Egypt, then fed you all you could eat, filled your hungry stomachs. But my people didn't listen. Israel paid no attention. So I let go of the reins and told them, run, do it your way. Oh, dear people, will you listen to me now? Israel, will you follow my map? I'll make short work of your enemies. Give your foes the back of my hand. I'll send the God haters cringing like dogs, never to be heard from again. You'll feast on my fresh baked bread spread with butter and rock pure honey. This is the word of the Lord. Let's spend some time together in prayer. Father God, we thank you that you do gather us in, that you have called each of us this morning to seek you to set aside this time to be in your presence. Lord, we lament that we are not able to come together physically this morning, that though we are a community united in faith, that for the good of our neighbor, we have to be apart. Lord, we pray that you would help us persevere until that day when we can come back together. Lord, may you be working alongside and through each of those doctors and researchers who are seeking a vaccine. Lord, we thank you for all of the frontline workers who are serving us so diligently in this time. Lord, we thank you for their servant hearts. 
Lord, we lift up to you all of those who are struggling with illness, who are dealing with depression. Lord, we pray for all those for whom anxiety is a more constant companion right now. Lord, we know that the season is difficult as we don't know when it will be over. And as there has been so much change, so many things are new and different. Lord, we thank you that we know that through it all, you remain the same, that you are constant. And that no matter what is going on in the world around us, that at any time we can come to you and we can find your loving arms open to us. Lord, may you also continue to strengthen us in our bonds of unity. We know that our forms of fellowship look a little different right now. And we thank you for all of the options that we have to stay connected. Lord, as we grow tired of technology, help us find new ways to reach out. Perhaps it's through phone calls or letters. May we continue to share your love with those around us. Lord, this morning we come to you seeking your wisdom. As we reflect on what it means to worship together as a community of believers, may your spirit be working through us. May our eyes be opened to what it is that you are calling us to. May we have fresh eyes to look on the worship that we are gathered for. Lord, we pray that as we open your scripture, as we sing songs, as we hear from one another, that our faith might grow deeper and deeper, that we might find in this time reminders of the firm foundation that we have in you, even when everything else seems chaotic. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, that we might boldly and confidently come right into your presence, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the spirit that you left amongst us to lead us and guide us, to call us and convict us, to remind us of your love. Lord, all these things we lift up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are more than one way to praise God. And at this time, we're going to take the opportunity to remember that one of the ways that we can praise God is through our tithes and our offerings, the giving back out of what God has blessed us with. We know that this is a difficult season for many, and so we encourage you to pray about what you are able to give at this time. But we do thank you for continuing to support the ministries here at Christ Community Church, as we do still have expenses during this season. So I'm going to remind you of the different ways that we can receive your offering in this season. We can do e-transfer. We have a page on our website, or you can mail in a check. Also, we are connected with PushPay, so you can either go through the app, or if you don't have an account yet, the website is there. And once you go to that website, they will have instructions for how to get all set up. So Nancy read for us our first scripture passage from Psalm 81. And our second scripture passage this morning is from Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to read verses 19 through 25. So Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, therefore my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an, 
from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks for it. So Psalm 81 sets up for us this Old Testament picture of the covenant relationship between God and his people. And that God has called the people of Israel to him. He has gathered them in. And they are called to worship and praise him. In return, God has asked that their covenant faithfulness be through obedience to his law. Now, as we see in Psalm 81, it does begin with this call to worship. With this entering into praise of lifting high the praises of God. But then we see this dialogue coming from God to his people. This reminder from him that they are actually not doing a great job of holding up their end of the covenant. That he has called them to live in obedience to his law and they're not doing it successfully. It ends with this reminder of what great things would come to his people if only they could be faithful. Now we've just come through Lent and through Holy Week and through Easter. So we've been able to reflect on the fact that time after time, God's people were unable to fulfill their end of the covenant. That despite their best efforts, they were not able to be obedient. If we had spent more time in the Old Testament, we would see that their worship then often involved a lot of sacrifices. That for the sins of the people, they were called to bring forth animals to be slaughtered, that they might be cleansed. We also find in the Old Testament descriptions of their worship spaces. For the people of Israel, before they were settled, it was the tabernacle. And then once they were established in Jerusalem, it was the temple. But what was common to both of these places were these curtains that were hung between the people and the Ark of the Covenant. There were several layers to these buildings and the general public could be on the outside. And then priests could go in part way, but only one priest once a year, and after making lots of careful preparations, was allowed to enter that most holy place, to go into that space where the presence of God chose to dwell. As we walk through Holy Week and as we reflect on the story of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. We're reminded that as Jesus died, that temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. That separation between God and his people is broken down by God himself. Now God's presence is accessible to all who enter in all who choose to seek God. This morning we get to reflect on what a joy it is that as Christians, we continue to benefit from that tearing of the curtain. As we reflect, as I reflected, I realized how much I often take it for granted that when I come to a church or when I go to a chapel, I don't think twice 
about boldly walking into that space, about eagerly seeking an encounter with God in the midst of a community of believers. I can come before the cross and kneel down in prayer and know that my Father in heaven is hearing all that I am saying. How great a joy that truly is. And yet, before Jesus' death, we would not have been able to do that. We could only get so close, but there was still space between us and the presence of God. So we hear in Hebrews this reminder that our confidence comes because of Jesus, because of his blood that was shed. So we are post-Easter Christians. The history of God's people is important for us to learn from. But the way that we interact with God is heavily influenced by the fact that Jesus has already come and died. He has been the ultimate sacrifice who cleanses us of our sins, who has opened that curtain that we might not have to be separated from God any longer. That we don't have to go to priests as intermediaries but that me, as a chosen individual selected by God, can confidently walk into God's presence and worship him. Now, because we also have the Holy Spirit, we know that God is not simply in one place. That when we leave the church, that God is now no longer with us. We know that God goes with us wherever we are and that God's spirit is everywhere at all times. But there is still something special about the church sanctuaries because that is where the community of God comes together. That is where worship happens. Now there are three main exhortations in this passage. They're not really commands as much as encouragements to do something together. The three that we're going to look at are let us approach, let us hold fast, and let us consider. Now, the first thing that I want to note about each of these three is that they are plural. The author of Hebrews doesn't say, let me or let you by yourself, but let us. The assumption is that these spaces of God dwelling that have been opened up to us are open to us as a community. We as individuals have God's spirit within us. But that doesn't mean that we're to start neglecting coming together as God's people to hear his promises, to confess of our sins, and to praise our amazing, awesome God. And to share with one another as we are on this faith journey together. So let us. Now the first call is to let us approach. And I've kind of already set this up in how we get to approach. We approach the throne of God because Jesus opened the way. We each of us have been given the gift of faith to say, I have heard about Jesus' death. I believe in the power of his sacrifice. And I am confident 
that through his blood I am washed clean. So I no longer need to hide or be afraid of God's presence. I am confident that I can approach God because of Jesus. And I am confident that I can approach with this community around me because we are united by the same faith. God has put in each of our hearts the power of Jesus' sacrifice. We all share that same belief. So we come together confident that God desires us to come. Then we move to the second one. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. So we know that it is God who gathers us into worship. And we know that we can respond to that calling confidently because of the blood of Jesus cleansing us and because of his death that opened the curtain that allowed us to enter right into God's presence. But there is still this covenant relationship. Sure, it has changed, but it is not new. It's kind of been updated and that God has called his people to be in covenant with him. We as God's people can't uphold our end on our own. So we believe in Jesus who upholds that perfect obedience. He's the only one who can, but he offers us the grace and the forgiveness through his dying on the cross, even though he was innocent. These are the promises that we are given as believers in Jesus. When we are baptized, we are saying that God has chosen us as his people and that the blessings that he has promised to his people are for us. When we come to the communion table, we are reminded that God is the host and that someday we will partake of that eternal feast in heaven and that God even now provides for all of our needs, that we receive living water, that we are nourished not just by bread, but by God. Those can be hard promises though to cling to sometimes. Right now we are living in a season of uncertainty, a season of change. But even before this, we all can look back on our lives and think of times where our faith in God was tested, where it seemed that the promises of the covenant perhaps were not coming true in our own lives. That is the beauty of worship that we are gathered together as a community to boldly come into God's presence, but also to be reminded of what we are holding fast to. These are not empty promises. It is true that trials and suffering are going to come. Jesus told his followers to take up their cross to follow him. And the way of the cross is hard and painful. But God's promises are trustworthy and true. And when we forget that, let us come together to be reminded that if we hold fast, we will see that light has triumphed over darkness. That Jesus has already claimed victory over sin and death. That we are not alone. 
that God is with us. And that God has called and gathered around us a community to love us and encourage us. And that brings us this morning to our third place, exhortation. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love the wording of that. It doesn't simply say, let's encourage each other, let's do good works together. But it says that we are gathered together in worship to consider how to provoke. In the message, Eugene Peterson talks about seeing how inventive we can be. That is part of our task as a worshiping community. To come together to praise our God, to be reminded of his promises, but also to be creative as our God is creative. One of the promises that we get to hold fast to is that we are image bearers of our God in heaven. And if we reflect God's image, then that means that we get to reflect God's traits. And God is the ultimate creator. He is the most inventive being in the universe. So that means that we are also called to be creative, to be inventive not just in the things that we fashion with our hands, but how we encourage each other and provoke each other to good deeds. My small group was reflecting on a chapter last night where we talked about what it means to truly be a loving person. And it talked about how Love is not simply your actions, but it's your character. And that the actions come out of your character desiring to be loving. We also talked about how that can be really difficult. But the beauty of small groups, the beauty of communal worship, is that we do get to come together and confess about the things that we are sinful in, the times that we are not loving. And then we get to talk together about what does this look like? In this instance, how do I love someone? When I am grieving a hurt, how do I love? When I am despairing about the darkness, how do I joyfully show love to God's creation, to my brothers and sisters around me? God created us all with different gifts, with different personalities, different character traits. And that is a beautiful thing because when we come together in community, we get to learn from one another. The areas where I stumble, I get to turn to my brother and sister and say, help me grow. And in turn, the areas that I am feeling that God is blessing me, I can lend a hand to someone else who is struggling and say, let me walk with you as you grow in this area. But that only works if we come together. If we acknowledge that these are the things that God still desires of us. We as post-Easter Christians celebrate the cross. We celebrate the grace and the mercy 
the forgiveness that we find in Jesus' blood. But we also have to remember that Jesus' death on the cross did not mean an end of the covenant. It simply meant we actually get to say in Jesus' name, I want to live into that covenant. But by coming as a community, by walking through the doors of our sanctuary, coming before the cross, singing songs of praise, confessing to one another and to God, sharing things we are grateful for, and learning from God's word. We are living out what Jesus' sacrifice means. If we neglected to meet together, it would be as if the curtain had never torn. Our worship is a living symbol of our gift of faith and our receipt of Jesus' sacrifice to confidently come into God's presence. And as we go back out through those sanctuary doors, we go knowing that we're not alone, knowing that we are surrounded by a community who is going to regularly encourage us, brainstorm with us, challenge us, journey with us as we seek to live out the love of God as we seek to truly incorporate into our hearts what it means to be chosen. It is true that spiritual growth can happen any time we seek God. When I am walking in the woods, I have the opportunity to pray to God, to be amazed at his creation. At home, I can pick up my Bible on my own and be reminded of God's promises. But there is something special about the community of believers coming together, being united in our faith, and saying, let us It is truly different in this season. We're not able to physically gather, but I've been amazed these past weeks at the ways that our community is still encouraging and loving one another. That is how strong the unity we have in Christ truly is. That even when fears and anxieties are swirling around us, that even when perhaps our only connection is through the phone or the computer, we can still say we are a community because of Jesus. Because God has gathered us and what God has gathered we can't scatter. So as we think about what it truly means when we come to worship, it is not simply to be a routine. It's not about earning gold stars from God. It is about truly knowing what Jesus accomplished on Easter, what it meant that that curtain hanging in front of the Holy of Holies, it was torn. We are able to walk through it. It was torn top to bottom. We don't have to climb through a hole. We don't have to finish getting it wide enough for us. God fully opened it so that we might enter by Jesus' blood into his presence confidently. 
And that is what worship is. It is living that out. It is responding to the goodness of our God. Covenant is active. And it includes different parties giving and taking. And that is worship. We hear from God, we respond to God, and we share with one another so that we might all grow in our faith. We all might be reminded of God's promises and that we might be more inventive in how we live that promise out in the world. We know that our God is good and faithful, that he is consistent. So let us approach. Let us hold fast. And let us consider all the ways that we as a community are able to live out the promises of our faithful God in heaven. Let's pray together. Father God, you are so good. We thank you that you loved us enough that despite our repeated disobedience, you did not break the covenant with us but sent your son who might fulfill it so that through him we could have a relationship with you. Lord, as we come into spaces of worship, may we be reminded of your promises and may we be encouraged by our brothers and sisters and may we be inspired to go forth showing your love to your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to respond by reading a stanza from Our World Belongs to God. We're going to read stanza 34. And Abigail is going to lead us in that this morning. In our world... Where many journey alone, nameless in the bustling crowd, Satan and his evil forces seek room they may scatter and isolate. But God, by his gracious, gracious choosing in Christ, gathers a new community, those who by God's gift put their, tr their trust in Christ. In the new community, all are welcome. The homeless come home, the broken find healing, the sinner makes a new start. The despised are esteemed, the least are honored, and the last are first. Here the spirit guides and grace abounds. The church is, is the fellowship of those who confess Jesus as Lord. She is the bride of Christ. Has his chosen partner, loved by Jesus and loving him, delighting in his presence, seeking him in, the, in prayer, silent before the mystery of his love. Our new life is Christ, in Christ is celebrated and nourished in the fellowship of congregations where we, we praise God's name, hear the word proclaim, learn God's ways, confess our sins, offer our prayers and gifts, and celebrate the sacraments. As we close this time of worship together and prepare for the week ahead, go with this blessing from God. May the blessing of God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and of Christ who summons us to service, and of the Holy Spirit, 
who inspires generosity and love, be with us all. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord your God.